And now chapter 5, The Deliverance of Shishupal. King Yudhishthir became very happy after hearing the details of the Jarasandha episode, and he spoke as follows. My dear Krishna, O eternal form of bliss and knowledge, all the exalted directors of the affairs of this material world, including Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva, and King Indra, are always anxious to receive and carry out orders from you. And whenever they are fortunate enough to receive such orders, they immediately take them and keep them in their hearts. O Krishna, you are unlimited, and although we sometimes think of ourselves as royal kings and rulers of the world, and become puffed up over our paltry positions, we are very poor in heart. Actually, we are fit to be punished by you, but the wonder is that instead of punishing us, you so kindly and mercifully accept our orders and carry them out properly. Others are very surprised that your Lordship can play the part of an ordinary human being, but we can understand that you are performing these activities just like a dramatic artist. Your real position is always exalted, ex exactly like that of the sun, which always remains at the same temperature during both the time of its rising and the time of its setting. Although we feel the difference in temperature between the rising and the setting sun, the temperature of the sun never changes. You are always transcendentally equipoised, neither pleased nor disturbed by any condition of material affairs. You are the Supreme Brahman, the Personality of Godhead, and for you there are no relativities. My dear Madhava, you are never defeated by anyone. Material distinctions, this is me, this is you, this is mine, this is yours, are all conspicuous by dint of their absence in you. Such distinctions are visible in the lives of everyone, even the animals, but pure devotees are freed from these false distinctions. Since these distinctions are absent in your devotees, they cannot possibly be present in you. After satisfying Krishna in this way, King Yudhishthir arranged to perform the Rajasuya sacrifice. He invited all the qualified Brahmins and sages to take part and appointed them to different positions as priests in charge of the sacrificial arena. He invited the most expert Brahmins and sages whose names are as follows. Krishna Dwaipayan Vyasdev Bharadvaj, Sumantu, Gautam, Asit, Vasishta, Chayavan, Kanva, Maitreya, Kavash, Trit, Vishvamitra, Vamadev, Sumati, Jaimini, Kratu, Pail, Parashara, Garga, Vaishampayan, Artava, Kashyap, Daumya, Parashurama, Shukracharya, Asuri, Vitihotra, Maruchanda, Virasen, and Akritavran. Besides all these Brahmins and sages, he invited such respectable old men as Dronacharya, Bhishma, the grandfather of the Kurus, Kripacharya, and Dhritarashtra. He also invited all the sons of Dhritarashtra headed by Duryodhan and also the great devotee Vidura. Kings from different parts of the world along with their ministers and secretaries were also invited to see the great sacrifice performed by King Yudhishthir and the citizens comprising learned Brahmins, chivalrous Kshatriyas, well-to-do Vaishyas and faithful Sudras all visited the ceremony.
The Brahmin priests and sages in charge of the sacrificial ceremony constructed the sacrificial arena as usual with a plow of gold, and they initiated King Yudhishthir as the performer of the great sacrifice in accordance with Vedic rituals. Long years ago, when Varun performed a similar sacrifice, all the sacrificial utensils were made of gold. Similarly, in the Rajasuya sacrifice of King Yudhishthir, all the utensils required for the sacrifice were golden. Present by the invitation of King Yudhishthir to participate in the great sacrifice were all the exalted demigods like Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva, and Indra, the King of Heaven, accompanied by their associates as well as the predominating deities of higher planetary systems like Gandharvalok, Siddhalok, Janalok, Tapalok, Nagalok, Yakshalok, Rakshashalok, Pakshilok, and Charanalok, as well as famous kings and their queens. All the respectable sages, kings, and demigods who assembled there agreed unanimously that King Yudhishthir was quite competent to take the responsibility of performing the Rajasuya sacrifice. No one was in disagreement on this fact. Everyone thoroughly knew the position of King Yudhishthir. Because he was a great devotee of Lord Krishna, no accomplishment was extraordinary for him. The learned Brahmins and priests saw to it that the sacrifice by Maharaj Yudhishthir was performed exactly the same way as performed in bygone ages by the demigod Varun. According to the Vedic system, whenever there is an arrangement for sacrifice, the members participating are offered the juice of the soma plant, which is a kind of life-giving beverage. On the day for extracting the soma juice, King Yudhishthir very respectfully received the special priest who had been engaged to detect any mistake in the formalities of sacrificial procedure. The idea is that the Vedic mantras must be enunciated perfectly and chanted with the proper accent. If the priests who are engaged in this business commit any mistake, the checker or referee priest immediately corrects the procedure and thus the ritualistic performances are perfectly executed. Unless perfectly executed, a sacrifice cannot yield the desired result. In this age of Kali, there is no such learned Brahmin or priest available. Therefore, all such sacrifices are forbidden. The only sacrifice recommended in the Shastras is the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra. Another important procedure is that the most exalted personality in the assembly of such a sacrificial ceremony is first offered worship. After all arrangements were made for Yudhishthira's sacrifice, the next consideration was who should be worshipped first in the ceremony. This particular ceremony is called Agra Puja. Agra means first and Puja means worship. This Agra Puja is similar to election of the president. In the sacrificial assembly, all the members were very exalted. Some proposed to elect one person as the perfect candidate for accepting Agra Puja, and others proposed someone else. When the matter remained undecided, Sahadev began to speak in favor of Lord Krishna. He said, Lord Krishna, the best amongst the members of the Yadu dynasty, and the protector of his devotees is the most exalted personality in this assembly. Therefore, I think that he should, without any objection, be offered the honor of being worshipped first. Although demigods such as Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva, Indra, the king of heavenly planets, and many other exalted personalities are present in this assembly, no one can be equal to or greater than Krishna in terms of time, space, riches, strength, reputation, wisdom, renunciation, or any other consideration. 
anything considered opulent is present originally in Krishna. As an individual soul is the basic principle of the growth of his material body, Krishna is the super-soul of this cosmic manifestation. All Vedic ritualistic ceremonies, such as the performance of sacrifices, the offering of oblations in the fire, the chanting of the Vedic hymns, and the practice of mystic yoga are meant for realizing Krishna. Whether one follows the path of fruitive activities or the path of philosophical speculation, the ultimate destination is Krishna. All bona fide methods of self-realization are meant for understanding Krishna. Ladies and gentlemen, it is superfluous to speak about Krishna because every one of you exalted personalities knows the Supreme Brahman, Lord Krishna, for whom there are no material differences between body and soul, between energy and the energetic, or between one part of the body and another. And since everyone is a part and parcel of Krishna, there is no qualitative difference between Krishna and all living entities. Everything is an emanation of Krishna's energies, material and spiritual. Krishna's energies are like the heat and light of fire. There is no difference between the quality of heat and light and the fire itself. Also, Krishna can do anything He likes with any part of His body. We can execute a particular action with the help of a particular part of our body, but He can do anything and everything with any part of His body. And because His transcendental body is full of knowledge and bliss in eternity, He doesn't undergo the six kinds of material change, birth, existence, growth, production, dwindling, and vanishing. Unforced by any external energy, he is the supreme cause of the creation, maintenance, and dissolution of everything that be. By the grace of Krishna only, everyone is engaged in the practice of religion, the development of economic conditions, the satisfaction of the senses, and ultimately the achievement of liberation from material bondage. These four principles of progressive life can be executed by the mercy of Krishna only. He should therefore be offered the first worship of this great sacrifice, and no one should disagree. As by watering the root, the watering of the branches, twigs, leaves, and flowers is automatically accomplished, or as by supplying food to the stomach, the nutrition and metabolism of all parts of the body are automatically established, so by offering the first worship to Krishna, Everyone present in this meeting, including the great demigods, will be satisfied. If anyone is charitably disposed, it will be very good for him to give charity only to Krishna, who is the super-soul of everyone, regardless of his particular body or individual personality. Krishna is present as the super-soul in every living being. And if we can satisfy him, then every living being will automatically be satisfied. Sahadev was fortunate to know of the glories of Krishna, and after describing them in brief, he stopped speaking. After this speech, all the members present in that great sacrificial assembly applauded, confirming his words continuously by saying, Everything you have said is completely perfect. Everything you have said is completely perfect. King Yudhishthir, after hearing the confirmation of all present, especially of the Brahmins and learned sages, worshipped Lord Krishna according to the regulative principles of the Vedic injunctions. First of all, King Yudhishthir, along with his brothers, wives, children, other relatives and ministers, washed the lotus feet of Lord Krishna and sprinkled the water on their heads. After this, he offered Lord Krishna various kinds of yellow silken garments and presented heaps of jewelry and ornaments before him for his use.
King Yudhishthir felt such ecstasy by honoring Krishna, his only lovable object, that tears glided down from his eyes, and although he wanted to, he could not see Lord Krishna very well. When Lord Krishna was thus worshipped by King Yudhishthir, all the members present in the assembly stood up with folded hands and began to chant, Jaya, Jaya, Nama, Nama. All joined together to offer their respectful obeisances to Krishna, and there were showers of flowers from the sky. In that meeting, King Shishupal was also present. He was an avowed enemy of Krishna for many reasons, especially because of Krishna's having stolen Rukmini from the marriage ceremony. Therefore, he could not tolerate such honor to Krishna and glorification of his qualities. Instead of being happy to hear the glories of the Lord, he became very angry. When everyone offered respect to Krishna by standing up, Shishupal remained in his seat. But as he became angrier at Krishna being honored, he stood up suddenly, raised his hand, and spoke very strongly and fearlessly against Lord Krishna in such a way that Lord Krishna could hear him distinctly. Shishupal said, Ladies and gentlemen, I can appreciate now the statement of the Vedas that, after all, time is the predominating factor. In spite of all endeavors to the contrary, the time element executes its own plan without opposition. For example, one may try his best to live, but when the time for death comes, no one can check it. I see here that although many stalwart personalities are present in this assembly, the influence of time is so strong that they have been misled by the statement of a boy who has foolishly spoken about Krishna. Many learned sages and elderly persons are present, but still they have accepted the statement of a foolish boy. This means that by the influence of time, even the intelligence of such honored persons as those present in this meeting can be misdirected. I fully agree with the respectable persons present here that they are competent to select the personality who can be worshipped first, but I cannot agree with the statement of a boy like Sahadev who has spoken so highly about Krishna and has recommended that Krishna is fit to accept the first worship in the sacrifice. I can see that in this meeting there are many personalities who have undergone great austerities, who are highly learned, and who have performed many penances. By their knowledge and direction, they can deliver many persons who are suffering from the pangs of material existence. There are great rishis here, whose knowledge has no bounds, as well as many self-realized persons and Brahmins also. And therefore I think that any one of them could have been selected for the first worship, because they are worshipable even by the great demigods, kings and emperors. I cannot understand how you have selected this cowherd boy, Krishna, and have left aside all these other great personalities. I think Krishna to be no better than a crow. How can he be fit to accept the first worship in this great sacrifice? We cannot even ascertain which caste this Krishna belongs to or what his actual occupational duty is. Actually, Krishna does not belong to any caste, nor does he have to perform any occupational duty. It is stated in the Vedas that the Supreme Lord has nothing to do as his prescribed duty. Whatever has to be done on his behalf is executed by his different energies. Shishupal continued, Krishna does not belong to a high family. He is so independent that no one knows his principles of religious life. 
Indeed, it appears that he is outside the jurisdiction of all religious principles. He always acts independently, not caring for the Vedic injunctions and regulative principles. Therefore, he is devoid of all good qualities. Shishupal indirectly praised Krishna by saying that he is not within the jurisdiction of Vedic injunctions. This is true because he is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That he has no qualities means that Krishna has no material qualities. And because he is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he acts independently, not caring for conventions in social or religious principles. Shishupal continued, Under these circumstances, how can he be fit to accept the first worship in the sacrifice? Krishna is so foolish that he has left Mathura, which is inhabited by highly elevated persons following the Vedic culture, and has taken shelter in the ocean where there is not even talk of the Vedas. Instead of living openly, he has constructed a fort within the water and is living in a place where there is no discussion of Vedic knowledge. And whenever he comes out of the fort, he simply harasses the citizens like a dacoit, thief, or rogue. Shishupal went crazy because of Krishna's being elected the supreme first worship person in that meeting. And he spoke so irresponsibly that it appeared that he had lost all his good fortune. Being overcast with misfortune, Shishupal continued to insult Krishna, and Lord Krishna patiently heard him without protest. Just as a lion does not care when a flock of jackals howl, Lord Krishna remained silent and unprovoked. Krishna did not reply to even a single accusation made by Shishupal. But all the members present in the meeting, except for a few who agreed with Shishupal, were very agitated because it is the duty of any respectable person not to tolerate blasphemy against God or his devotee. Some of them, who thought they could not properly take action against Shishupal, left the assembly in protest, covering their ears with their hands in order not to hear further accusations. Thus they left the meeting, condemning the action of Shishupal. It is the Vedic injunction that whenever there is blasphemy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one must immediately leave. If he does not do so, he becomes bereft of his pious activities and is degraded to a lower condition of life. All the kings present belonging to the Kuru dynasty, Matsya dynasty, Kekaya dynasty, and Srinjaya dynasty were very angry and immediately took up their swords and shields to kill Shishupal, who was so foolish that he was not even slightly agitated, although all the kings present were ready to kill him. Shishupal did not care to think of the pros and cons of his foolish talking, and instead of stopping when he saw that all the kings were ready to kill him, he stood to fight with them and took up his sword and shield. When Lord Krishna saw that they were going to fight in the arena of the auspicious Rajasuya Yajna, he personally pacified them. Out of his causeless mercy, he himself decided to kill Shishupal. When Shishupal was abusing the kings who were about to attack him, Lord Krishna took up his disc as sharp as the blade of a razor and immediately separated Shishupal's head from his body. When Shishupal was thus killed, a great roar and howl went up from the crowd. Taking advantage of that disturbance, the few kings who were supporters of Shishupal quickly left the assembly out of fear for their lives. But despite all this, the fortunate Shishupal's spirit soul immediately merged into the body of Lord Krishna in the presence of all 
exactly as a burning meteor falls to the surface of the globe. The merging of Shishupal's soul into the transcendental body of Krishna reminds us of the story of Jai and Vijay, who fell to the material world from the Vaikuntha planets upon being cursed by the four Kumaras. For their return to the Vaikuntha world, it was arranged that both Jai and Vijay, for three consecutive births, would act as deadly enemies of the Lord, and at the end of these lives, they would return to the Vaikuntha world and serve the Lord as His associates. Although Shishupal acted as the enemy of Krishna, he was not for a single moment out of Krishna consciousness. He was always absorbed in the thought of Krishna and thus he first got the salvation of Sayuja Mukti, merging into the existence of the Supreme, and was finally reinstated in his original position of personal service. The Bhagavad Gita corroborates the fact that if one is absorbed in the thought of the Supreme Lord at the time of death, he immediately enters the kingdom of God after quitting his material body. After the salvation of Shishupal, King Yudhishthira rewarded all the members present in the sacrificial assembly. He sufficiently remunerated the priests and learned sages for their engagement in the execution of the sacrifice. And after performing all this routine work, he took his bath. The bath at the end of the sacrifice is also technical. It is called the Avrabrita bath. Lord Krishna thus enabled the performance of the Rajasuya Yajna arranged by King Yudhishthira to be successfully completed, and being requested by his cousins and relatives, he remained in Hastinapur for a few months more. Although King Yudhishthira and his brothers were unwilling to have Lord Krishna leave Hastinapur, Krishna arranged to take permission from the king to return to Dwarka and thus he returned home along with his queens and ministers. The story of the fall of Jai and Vijay from the Vaikuntha planets to the material world is described in the seventh canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. The killing of Shishupal has a direct link with the narration of Jai and Vijay, but the most important instruction we get from this incident is that the Supreme Personality of Godhead, being absolute, can give salvation to everyone, whether one acts as his enemy or as his friend. It is therefore a misconception that the Lord acts with someone in relationship of friend and with someone else in the relationship of enemy. His being an enemy or friend is always on the absolute platform. There is no material distinction. After King Yudhishthira took his bath after the sacrifice and stood in the midst of all the learned sages and Brahmins, he seemed exactly like the King of Heaven and thus looked very beautiful. King Yudhishthira sufficiently rewarded all the demigods who participated in the Jagya and, being greatly satisfied, all of them left, praising the King's activities and glorifying Lord Krishna. When Shukdev Goswami narrated these incidents of Krishna's killing Shishupal and described the successful execution of the Rajasuya Jagya by Maharaj Yudhishthira, he also pointed out that after the successful termination of the Jagya, only one person was unhappy. He was Duryodhana. Duryodhana by nature was very envious because of his sinful life, and he appeared in the dynasty of the Kurus like a chronic disease personified to destroy the whole family. Shukdev Goswami assured Maharaj Parikshit that the pastimes of Lord Krishna, the killing of Shishupal and Jarasandha, and the releasing of the imprisoned kings are all transcendental vibrations 
and anyone who hears these narrations from the authorized persons will immediately be freed from all the reactions of sinful activities of his life. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purport of the third volume, fifth chapter of Krishna, The Deliverance of Shishupal.